about it and understanding it a little bit better. And we'll share a little bit more um, towards the end of the program in terms of how Digestive Collective can help you first. Um, let me hand over now to Minuri um, for the uh, next couple of, well, for about half an hour, 40 minutes, where she would be taking you, take, taking us all through a session on unconscious bias. Before I hand over to her, just a few um, house rules. Um, while she's presenting, we'll all go on mute and video off so that there is less distraction so that she can get the message across to us. And uh, towards the end, which is about 40 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes from now, um, we can switch back on uh, to ask any questions. If you have any questions while the presentation is going on, please feel free to put it into the chat box and we'll pick it up um, towards the end or as and when appropriate. Over to you, Minori. Thank you, Barney, for that. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and see the slides well. And if you're wondering why I put uh, board of directors to suicide at the hump seven down there, um, it's a, a project I'm really passionate about because um, it's focused on uh, providing aged care services for female Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka. Um, I'm very much a Buddhist. My father recently ordained as a monk. My great um, aunt is a monk as well, but they are very much a marginalized religious population in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, so that project is very much something I'm passionate about. And the Sustainable Education Foundation, uh, we connect uh, pretty much expat Sri Lankans with local students in Sri Lanka to help them with their career and academic choices. And um, in terms of, I guess, my day job, uh, I am the Diversity and Inclusion Lead uh, for Asia. Lend Lease is in the construction and property business based out in Australia. Um, so unconscious bias. So why this topic, right? Um, I love this quote um, from this movie, uh, Blades of Glory. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. About 10 years ago, it was a real thorough movie and it was made famous by a Kanye West and Jay-Z song as well. And um, they were referring to this song that made no sense at all, but everyone was dancing to it. Like, you know, everybody was uh, repeating the lyrics, but nobody had what it meant. And um, Will Ferrell's character said, you know, nobody knows what it means, but it's provocative. It gets the people going. And I feel like diversity and inclusion over the last maybe five or six years has essentially become that uh, because everybody is um, talking about it and throwing these words out there. Um, everybody just getting on the bandwagon without really understanding um, what it means. Uh, for me, the turning point uh, was doing my master's degree uh, and two subjects that I took on out of curiosity purely um, was uh, diversity and inclusion and sustainability. Um, really, you know, mind blown um, kind of moment there taking those um, to, uh, those subjects on and it really changed my perspective and to get a real appreciation for the value that diversity and inclusion adds to organizations and being part of Lend Lease as well uh, it was a company that was set up um, about 60 years ago by a Dutchman and he was very progressive for his time uh, in terms of setting up you know what you know as an EPF fund um, in Sri Lanka, you know, 60 years ago, which was unheard of. And he always said that, you know, a company cannot achieve um, success in the industry if it does not get the community with them, doesn't give back to the community, and also the employees are looked after. So diversity and inclusion is very much part of our agenda. And I'll share with you some instances where, you know, doing certain training sessions and awareness sessions really changed my um understanding of what unconscious bias is and um, like I said over the years you know diversity and inclusion has very much become about the campaign um, the glossy photos that you can put in your annual reports uh, or your job ads or whatever else and it's kind of uh, diluted from addressing the core issues that we really need to be talking about in our society in our organizations um, and also about having more open conversations as well. Um, so it's moved away from that to more the campaign photo opportunity style. And um, every time International Women's Day come, I dread looking at my phone sometimes, especially the photos that come from some of the Sri Lankan companies involve women standing next to a cake uh, that says happy International Women's Day and cutting cake or getting roses uh, that says happy International Women's Day. Um, and I look at these and I don't get angry at it, but I'm almost like, you know, 
we've lost the meaning of what International Women's Day is because it's just co being commercialized um, for instead, like, you know, if the suffrage women were to ever see um, these campaigns, they'd probably be like rolling in their grave because days like International Women's Day is, you know, where we should be talking about the hard stuff, about harassment, about bullying, about the glass ceiling, you know, um, about bringing people in the office together and talking about these subjects because roses and chocolates aren't going to cut it. But if you really look into why people are giving out roses and chocolates, I don't blame them because when you look at what you see on your social media in your advertising or product marketing like what do you see when you see a woman that is happy and beaming um, on our advert on our adverts or whatever else is you know when they've gotten a piece of chocolate or something sweet or with a bunch of flowers or jewelry right so that conditions our mind to think a certain way to go oh this is what makes women happy well no equal pay is what makes women happy and that's what we need to be talking about and using days like international women's day to raise this awareness to start having these conversations because chocolates and roses ain't gonna cut it um so that's what like even people who organize these sessions to go okay what do you as women want uh, on these sessions is a question we should be asking. So this is um, a great segue to go, you know, what is unconscious bias essentially? How do these things influence us and sometimes stop us from having the conversations that we need to um, in terms of diversity and inclusion agenda? So unconscious bias, to give you a very, I mean, you can Google all this, right? So I'm not going to get too much into the definitions and the uh, various types of biases. I'll just give you a quick um, intro. Um, the easiest way to think of unconscious biases are essentially snap judgments um, that we make um, to protect us from harm based on what's worked in the past. And where this originates from is basically going back to the caveman days. Um, this was pretty much what a caveman used to identify between the friendlies, i.e. the people who look like you, talk like you, act like you, versus people or animals or other things that don't, which tell you then that is a threat. Right. So over millions of years, we've learned to create these shortcuts in our head, like even right now, even though the circumstances may be different, we still have to make decisions that sometimes may be a reputational risk for you, sometimes may be a physical risk for you. Right. Um, so that uh, those are some of the things that we need to be um, aware of in terms of how long this has um, evolved from in terms of our human history. Um, and with these um, biases, um, you can split them into two, essentially. There are explicit biases. Basically, um, take, for example, somebody saying, I don't like somebody of a certain race or I don't like somebody of a certain nationality versus these implicit or unconscious biases that are so ingrained in you, you don't even realize you're acting on it. So how on earth are you supposed to you know, undo something that you can't even see? Um, so to give you a few examples oops, um, of what biases are, there are hundreds of biases that you can look up on Google, right? One is affinity bias. This is from a, a corporate perspective. Um, you hire or promote people that share the same race, gender, age, or educational background as you. I knew of an organization in Sri Lanka a while ago that used to write down the person's caste. Um, judging by their last name. Um, and they knew, uh, you know, people of a certain caste are more likely to make errors uh, based on, you know, their past experiences. Um, and there's also beauty bias where, you know, you judge people, especially um, women, uh, based on how attractive they look. And people who are, you know, seen as more attractive um, can be viewed more, posi uh, more positively and be treated more favorably than others that you don't find as um, attractive in the most traditional sense. Um, and I've, um, you know, experienced this um, with one of my um, ex-partners when I was engaged at the time, and somebody was introducing me um, and kept referring to my sister as the fiancé. And this happened twice, like about two or three times over. And I realized this wasn't a joke that they were doing. I was mortified, of course, and, you know, we had to correct that person. And, you know, do I have um, anger towards that person? Absolutely not. Um, that person has an absolute heart of gold, really lovely person. But what I realized was that was their beauty bias. 
um, kicking in to going, okay, you know, because this person is more attractive in my eyes, I will be introducing this person instead of who they were supposed to be introducing. Um, there's also confirmation bias um, where, you know, you always have a tendency to look or favor information that confirms your beliefs that you already hold. So sometimes this happens with our employee engagement surveys. Sometimes we are hell bent on telling a story that you believe aligns, but your data is saying otherwise. And then I've seen leaders um, who go looking for data that confirms the understanding of what they believe the story is, um, rather than speaking about um, the core issues at hand. Then what happens is you build campaigns, programs to address completely different areas uh, that are not of relevance that what your data is telling you. So based on um, what I was saying, so what influences unconscious biases, right? Um, it's a lot of things. It's what we observe when we are children uh, in terms of what our parents say, how our relatives or our friends react um, to certain situations or people even. Um, there's also media and advertising that can have a huge influence on how we view things. And these aren't things we consciously go out seeking because these are thrown in our faces. And if you repeat a message a certain number of times, you start to believe it in the back of our uh, back of our minds. And, you know, I'm sure I'm not a marketing person. I'm sure there's a psychology behind in terms of how they come up with campaigns and stuff that meet these. And children especially, uh, you know, pick up um, and apply negative racial stereotypes from between the ages of two to six. And um, drawing from personal examples again, uh, when my sister was born, she was much fairer than me. And nobody ever told me that I was like my sister was more attractive or I was less attractive or anything like that but I saw the words they were using to describe her and how they were describing her to other people um, and I started to notice that difference and my um, Amni used to tell me that I used to go and wash my face a lot after she was born in the hope that I'll grow fairer uh, so that you know the words that other people use to describe her they will use for me as well. Um, so this is uh, some of the pictures you have in front of you is going, uh, looking at ad campaigns, going back to, I believe, almost the 1800s in terms of how fairness um, has been viewed in our society and how advertising um, goes to show this. And to this day, even in a very different light, um, you get to see, you know, fairness screens being advertised as showing, you know, it empowers you, it makes you a lot more acceptable in society. And these things work in people's head and go, okay, I need to buy this so that, you know, I'll be more acceptable in society. So these are very much instances that appeal to unconscious biases. And I think the latest controversy was um, that last picture I have shown you there was a situation of blackface uh, that was very much being used. And did I think when I saw it and I was reading the threads, um, did I really think this was a conscious effort at racially profiling someone or anything like that? Not really. Um, and I really think it was very much an unconscious bias on whoever was doing this production to make this character stand out from the rest. Because, um, you know, with method acting, uh, you want to really distinguish yourself from the various characters you've played in the past. And they've got, yes, let's make this person dark skin because in real life, they are what you consider a very attractive person. So how do you make this person different? Um, and also, I believe, unattractive to suit the characteristics of this role. But I watched a few episodes of this teledrama and I was thinking, was that skin darkening necessary to bring out those characteristics of that character? Could they have delivered it without having made the skin darker? Absolutely. It was unnecessary in that instance. And it was very interesting seeing the reaction on social media, etc., some people were justifying it saying, you know, uh, Robert Downey Jr. in Tropic Thunder, um, you know, um, did blackface in the movie. Um, but, you know, so this was completely justified because it was required for the character. Well, no, because you have to understand where that movie Tropic Thunder was coming from. It was doing exactly what we are speaking about today is calling up the stereotypes and the cynicism in Hollywood, where you have a white actor playing a black actor when it's completely not necessary when there are perfectly 
great black actors out there to perform these roles, right? Um, and interesting enough, that movie also called out a character that was um, a black male rapper um, who was gay and could not come out as gay because he had to appeal to this certain stereotype. Because like I said, if you've seen an image enough and more times of what a black rapper in the US needs to look like, you expect, start to expect that uh, from everyone else that comes down the line as well. So when people in that situation, for example, they weren't unable to be them true authentic selves as a result because there was a stereotype or this unconscious bias, um, you know, that he needed to appeal to. And with the comments that these, I guess, um, actors and I believe the partner was um, sharing as well, um, you know, they were in complete denial that this sort of thing actually happened. Like, you know, what they were doing is wrong. And in situations like you just stop and ask, okay, why, like, why don't you get the point? And I guess with discrimination, um, usually if you are part of the majority religion and the majority race of a country, uh, you've had your parents support up through to almost your tertiary education, the likelihood of you having experienced any form of discrimination um, is probably very, very, very low. Um, I was one of them. I, you know, I did not experience any discrimination at all um, growing up in Sri Lanka, but moving to Australia and other countries and working there, absolutely, I have experienced discrimination and you tend to, and you are able to tell between what your, what the explicit uh, biases are and what your unconscious biases are that people um, come at you with things like, you know, oh, can you change your name, you know, to make it um, easily pronounceable, for example, uh, were some of the things that you experience. So I think it's very important in situations like, you know, this, where you are faced with something that you are uncomfortable with, that a dialogue be had. And I think that's what's important when it comes to unconscious biases rather than, you know, going at somebody because they've never experienced this ever in their life. It's about trying to have the conversation. Um, so can we overcome bias? Uh, my response to that is um, I love this quote, which kind of tells you where I'm trying to get at by um, Alvin Toffler. I highly um, recommend you read this book as well. Um, touches a bit on why we need um, learning experience, diverse learning experience in our life. And he says the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. And this is to me, in my experience of having gone from like the 20th century to the 21st century, um, stays true to its word, right? Um, because the reality is some people are afraid to change their mind because like I said, it goes against everything sometimes that have been taught to them for decades, if not millions of years of evolution you're trying to go against, right? And some things we really struggle um, to unlearn. Um, and these are things like, you know, religious beliefs, beauty uh, bias, for example, that I've mentioned as well. And these things have been drilled into us for the last 20, 30 plus years from our parents, our relatives, our friends, um, to our wider social circles, for example, right? So when you try to get someone to, um, hear out a different perspective or when you call them out for their behavior, people will become defensive. Um, so my recommendation to you is listen um, to understand and hear their side of the story as well, because to undo so many years of learnings is hard. And, you know, this is new information you are presenting to them that they're probably trying to process as well. So listen and don't react right? Um, to, to try and understand where they're coming from as well. And learning will also make people very uncomfortable. And in certain instances, it will make you cry. And it has for me as well. Um, so when I first moved to Australia, you know, I was told, I hate using this term, be wary of the adults um, because they are drunk. You know, they roam around everywhere. Um, they are brash. They are always angry. Um, always, you know, be wary of them. And I was like, okay. I went through, you know, citizenship exams. I, you know, watched Sunrise in the morning, which was their morning talk show. 
none of this was spoken about. So we were all happy and dandy Australians, you know, getting along our uh, business every day. And then when I joined with Lendlease, uh, they are very hardcore supporters of the Reconciliation Action Plan, which is essentially providing opportunities to the First Nations people of Australia, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia. And part of that program is education. And they made us do an online training session that went to the hardcore truth about what was done to the Aboriginal people of Australia, um, including slavery, um, taking land away from them, taking children away from their mothers. Up until 1967, the Aboriginal people of Australia weren't even considered humans. Uh, they were considered the flora and fauna of the country. Basically, you get where I'm getting at in terms of that classification. And I was so shocked, I couldn't continue with the training. I was so shocked that I started crying at work because I was led to believe this whole thing that these you know, people were angry and you know, they weren't um, conforming to our ways of life when they have a beautiful, amazing way of life um, that was just so different to how it is. So when you're applying or pressuring them to conform to a certain way, um, you know, they're not going to because you understand why things like family mean so much to them, you know, why the land means so much to them, why they, you know, because the concept of land doesn't apply to them. Uh, they don't have this sense of belonging to this like one place, for example. And that was so beautiful to learn. So it was a very emotional experience for me to challenge my views, to challenge my unconscious biases that I've had for, uh, you know, probably 13, 14 years at the time when I did that training. So be mindful of the fact that, you know, some people might feel ashamed when you call them out for their unconscious biases. So be diplomatic in terms of how, and like have an open conversation and go, okay, I want to hear where you're coming from with this. Because, you know, there's this whole other uh, perspective that you need to, you know, think you need to consider. So always question and always seek up new perspective. And like I said, learn, unlearn and relearn. I love this quote also by Martin Luther King uh, the third uh, with the recent BLM movement that was happening uh, where he said, you know, as his father explained during his lifetime, a riot is a language of the unheard. Um, and I think this is so key for us this day and age where we're always, um, reacting to things you know whether it be on social media or you know fake news reports that we see we are always reacting we don't i feel like sit this day and age and and listen to learn uh we, we're listening to react um so a lot of the time you know people who face unconscious biases in their lifetime whether it be racial or other forms are just not unheard. So like I said, when you are celebrating days like International Women's Day or, you know, any other forum, for example, make sure that, you know, you give, you make forums where people are heard and they're able to speak in a secure environment. As leaders, if I have leaders on the call here, that is my call to action for you. Create a safe space. So things like unconscious biases can be spoken about. And when people are heard, they feel recognized because otherwise what happens if you don't do it in, I guess, a safe zone is you have pretty much these rights, whether it be people, you know, not turning up for work or, you know, uh, taking your branding down, for example, that's what happens because they don't feel unheard. And to me, being in diversity and inclusion or HR, a lot when you look at a lot of our problems, a lot of the frustrations that come from are where people don't feel like they are heard in organizations. So how does, um, you know, negative bias impact organizational growth? So something, um, you know, for you to think about uh, when you do an ad campaign, for example, do you shy away uh, from things like using bright pink, for example, thinking um, that is too girly? Um, and, you know, does your recruitment processes have things like age, gender, marital status as part of the hiring criteria. Um, and um, because you really, I know that's very much a standard right now uh, in some companies in Sri Lanka, but you have to ask, what does this have to do with you know, hiring somebody for a role, any of these things? Um, 
it's, it's got nothing to do with it because what you need to look for are competencies. But organizations with these unconscious biases seek out these molds um, where you know it's worked for them in the past. So they're trying to replicate that, right? But that is not gonna serve you any good. And one thing I want you to think about as well, and maybe during our Q&A that we can um, open up for questions is, you know, do your recruitment ads also call out for years of experience, right? I know this is very common to ask for years of experience, but what you do by including things like years of experience on there is you automatically discourage women and uh, men from lower socioeconomic backgrounds that actually have care duties and have taken time out of their um, career to care for elderly parents, um, children, etc. So the minute they see that ad and they go, oh, they want like, you know, 10 years of experience, I've got only eight, you automatically discounted them from the process. And these could be completely capable candidates that you're discouraging from even hitting the apply now button. So you should be focusing on, you know, your job ads and stuff, what outcomes um, you're looking for from candidates. And that's more likely to encourage um, women and other minorities, even from say the LGBTQ plus uh, community or even men with care duties or people with disabilities to apply for these roles, right? Um, and all these, um, even the words that you choose on ads um, are in, like, you know, very much influenced by your unconscious biases. So I, I really like you to take this time, um, you know, once you go back to your offices and review things like your job ads and see, you know, do you use words like manpower in there, for example, right? That really um, might deter a, a diverse pool of candidates um, coming into your organization. Um, it also stifles new ideas, right? Because if you don't have a, di a diverse pool of people in your organization, you're going to churn the same old crap again and again, right? You're not going to come up with any innovation basically in your organization as a result, uh, nor will you have people that challenge you, um, especially when you're doing projects and you're trying to identify things like risks, for example, you're not going to have, uh, you know, your devil's advocate or, you know, somebody else who thinks a different way to help you through um, those processes. Um, also, you will probably have very limited access to new customer bases. Um, in our organization, we have a gentleman who is in, um, who is wheelchair, um, you know, uses a wheelchair. Um, and because of his ability in terms of um, accessibility and his knowledge, we make our buildings a lot more accessible for people with disabilities as a result that we wouldn't have had insight to or access to if we all had, you know, able-bodied people trying to come up with these products, right? And also the mental health impacts, because if you have these negative biases, because mental health, I think, is something that's just hardly spoken about in organizations because of stigma that's attached to it, right? And that's not what you want to do, because when you have these unconscious biases and people pick up on these things, right? When they see people of a certain stereotype being promoted or people of a certain, um, I guess, look or the way they act being hired into the organization and, you know, what... I'm saying, like, you know, you feel like the black sheep, there's no inclusivity, you know, you can't speak out about things because, you know, everybody's like, you know, those seagulls in Finding Nemo that just repeat the same thing again and again. And as a result of this, I think what you will find is a lack of honesty as well from people. The more people are marginalized because of these biases, you won't find people telling you what improvements you can make in the organization or giving you feedback as well, right? So that's, I think, is very important for you um, to keep in mind in terms of what happens when bias negatively impacts an organization growth as well. So what does an organization bias with uh, organization without bias look like, right? Um, to me, uh, based on my experiences, it has access to untapped talent pools that you wouldn't consider um, traditionally. Um, you know, like I said, minorities, people with disabilities, even uh, people who identify as LGBTIQ will be, uh, will be encouraged to apply for your organization and thrive in your organizations. Your employees will be open to learning new things because they're constantly being engaged and challenged in a good way. Uh, they're also not afraid to voice their opinion. Um, you know, they're not afraid of any repercussions that may um, come their way. They can be honest in their opinion. They're also not afraid of failing and taking calculated risks, uh, which, meant, which means probably new customer bases and new products and new markets for you. 
uh, employees are always trying out new ideas because again, they're not afraid to fail. And you have you know, all these diverse views that come in to support you along the way. It is also rewarding. Uh, so you don't have to have specialist reward programs where you give, you know, I don't know, gift hampers or points or anything like that. It's part of the job. Um, so, you know, you feel part of a team, even though it is diverse because that those biases are not there. You feel free to be yourself. Um, and also um, you're hired for the value fit, not the cultural fit. And the difference there is, you know, think of value fit as a jigsaw puzzle, whereas think of a cultural fit like you're trying to weave a pattern. Uh, so when you hire people for cultural fit, uh, you're trying to pretty much fit people into a mold that you already have. And like I said, you're just going to churn out the same people again and again. Whereas when you look at your organization, try to look at, especially in your team, to ask what is missing in my team. If I have three people that are really good at doing one thing, and I need this one other thing done that you're not getting the skills from them. So what the new person you're hiring into the organization, can they be completely opposite to this and, and fit that jigsaw puzzle, right? And also performance is assessed based on outcome, not about what people think about each other. And this will be very evident as part of your you know, performance review. So um, like I said, you know, you can talk about unconscious biases, uh, which is great to opening up uh, your culture. But if your systems and your processes don't account for this, um, you're not going to have an organization that is without bias. Uh, you'll continue to have these great forums and panel discussions, etc. But you need to systemize these and you need to repeat the messaging. One of the best advices I've had from uh, one of the change managers I've worked with is you need to repeat a message seven times, seven times from your senior leadership, from your middle manager, from your team leaders, on your social media, on your policy documentation for a message to hit home. Um, and that to me, you know, unconscious bias is again, one of those things that can make or break an organization. Um, it's not something that you can't see, but something you can work towards. Cause I don't think you can ever take away unconscious biases. Like I said, it's millions of years of evolutions of shortcuts you're trying to do away with. But what we can do is be more aware of it and create an organization culture that is more accepting of diverse views. And that's all from me. Bani, over to you. Okay, so there are a couple of questions, Minuri. Um, Ooh, before okay. I let you go. <laughs> um, sure. So here we go. So Bimal is asking about um, what are your thoughts of people acting on instinct, especially when data is not available, not always available. Can instincts be different to stereotyping or unconscious bias? I think instincts good question. Well, it's a very good question. It's a difficult question. And I don't want to give you a this is the answer <laughs> um, type uh, thing. Um, because yeah, I think sometimes you have to rely on instincts, but with data as well, I mean, like we have access to so much data <laughs> right now, right? So I wouldn't entirely like when you look at Google or wherever else. So um instincts are like it's part of like lessons learned. Um, as well as, you know, unconscious biases as well. So, yeah, I think it is very much an unconscious bias, but you have to rely on it um, to make certain decisions along the way, I think. Yeah. I don't think that answered the question, to be really honest, because it's one of those very difficult ones. Uh, but that's my answer to you. Next question um, is on experience uh, through your work with uh, diversity. Um, sorry, can you see the question? If there are, if, if it's not in the same order as you, Barney, but I'll try to follow. Oh, okay. Um, do you have experience through your work if a diverse slates of work and if they are practical uh, and effective in minimizing unconscious bias during recruitment? So I'd really like to know what a diverse slate is. Yeah, I'm also not Cause, sure. Yeah, because it's it's in capital letters. So I see if it's referring to something um, that I'm not familiar. Kumudu, you want to try and explain that? Um, hi, um, Minuri, basically, I think diverse slate refers to, I've only read about it and we don't really practice it, mm -hmm. but 
the theory is that if you are shortlisting, let's say for an interview or something like that, um, would you that you you force the um, team to sort of put in at least two women or two people of color or something like that? So um, effectively, the chances of a person of color or a woman or someone like that actually does get hired. So I just wanted to know whether that was practical and whether people are doing it and if it's something that will kind of eliminate unconscious bias. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something a lot of organizations practice, especially in industries where, you know, you, you need women, especially um, in the candidate slate. Look, I am of the view um, that the best candidates should be put forward. And this is something I struggle with because in order for us to get to equity or to get to representation, uh, you need to sometimes enable these diverse slates to work. So for our organization, it has worked, um, especially women in engineering, in construction, has been um, very hard to get. Um, so absolutely diverse slates are one aspect that we use. Um, I've seen it also being used um, in a number of other multinational organizations, part of the, uh, the DNI corporate network I'm part of as well. So it has worked for some organizations. Interestingly, for the Sustainable Education Foundation, um, we completely went blind and we literally took away gender, university, because I know it's a big influence in Sri Lanka where they come from, um, uh, gender, yeah, all that stuff we name, everything we took away. And uh, we pretty much um, so, uh, selected people purely by merit. And interesting enough, we got a 60-40 representation. So 60% men and 40% women, which was higher than the last time when we did the program, uh, when we looked at all these individual aspects. So it's worked both ways. Okay, um, next question. Uh, how would you address the, uh, address the following issue? A common statement through a few managers in organizations I work in uh, usually say limit uh, females in the recruitment shortlist, please. Why? Because they can't work late nights. When they get preggy, <laughs> they will need a lot of leave. <laughs> uh, okay, let me just calm down for a second. <laughs> but uh, no, um, they're very common. And I think it just comes with the, the stigma, right? Um, and again, it's, it's very hard. And to me, like, I know diversity included, everybody's like, where's the business case? Where's the business case? And I'm like, you don't always need a business case. It's about doing the right thing uh, by like, uh, you know, the community by your people and, and sometimes you can't provide a business case right like you can't say that you know women get pregnant and they need a lot of leave like yeah <laughs> like you know um but how do we enable that um to happen and i think it, it's about having those conversations and i think getting giving them the education that they need um, and also sharing again I mean going back to the data is like the engagement and the brand value that you get as a result of providing these opportunities to women um, and that's the really businessy side but I mean I always argue like to like even now some of the programs I do they're like why and I'm like because it's the right thing to do <laughs> um, right it's about providing um, opportunities to people and um, yeah I mean you can obviously come up with a business case but I would always go with it's, it's the right thing to do and look if, if your managers don't think like that maybe you should reconsider what kind of organization you work for as well yeah. Minuri, if I could just add to that, this is Chinti. Um, I think um, it, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but if you look around, uh, the, you know, uh, the population, majority of us are women, right? Uh, and uh, which also means if you are a company that's providing any kind of product or service um, to, uh, you know, the greater population, um, you're serving women, right? And the simple fact of the matter is that diverse opinions uh, make a better product, make better services um, that you deliver to that population, right? Um, so th that to me, uh, so while I'm also the president here, I'm also a CEO of a company, that to me is, is the business case, right? Uh, if I want to deliver uh, the best possible service to my clients, I need to make sure that I get diverse opinions, not the same opinion. 
and uh, you know diversify my team not just from gender perspective but all aspects of diversity i hope that helps answer uh, suantri's question i'm going to move on to the next question because there are a few more um, I have, so next question is, I have minimal experience working in uh, companies in Sri Lanka, therefore this statement can, uh, can't be generalized, but I, I have not seen much effort from companies in Sri Lanka to address the unconscious bias compared to companies in other countries. Um, what do you think Sri Lankan companies can do better to solve this problem? Join DCLK uh, is the <laughs> answer, uh, but, uh, it's, it's very much, you know, attending these sessions, uh, raising awareness. And I guess there's also the question, you know, if management is do, isn't doing anything, what can employees do, right? And, you know, employee resource groups um, are areas that I find very successful in trying to push the agenda when it comes to diversity inclusion. Because if you have people who are passionate enough um, to drive the conversations, to start having these um I guess, subjects as part of like, you know, the agenda in organizations, you can get this through. So our company's construction and we actually have an award-winning LGBTIQ movement, right? Construction industry is probably the one with like one of the biggest stigmas when it comes to, um, you know, the LGBTIQ uh, populations um, in any country, given the, you know, stereotyping, you can imagine what the construction industry looks like. But we had really passionate individuals, both in an office setting, a site setting, and at a leadership level as well, where some people actually, because of these ERGs, for the first time in their life, um, they came out. Um, as gay. Um, so that's the power sometimes if employees band together and create ERGs that you can have to raise these um, matters with organizations, but even joining organizations like DCLK to attend these sessions and then, you know, spreading the word, I think is very important as well. Uh, if, I, if I may just add one thing, being uh, an HR person will having worked in Sri Lanka for the past 15, 20 years, um, you're right, certain leadership uh, leaders of companies don't see this as a priority, don't see the business value. Um, my advice there is you have to just keep trying and keep giving them different cases towards it uh, because everybody doesn't think the same way, you know, that goes into the whole diversity aspect also. So how you convince your different bosses has to be different and you do have to take the time to understand what appeals to that boss and try to give the answers that actually help him, in this case, I'm assuming these are men bosses, are convinced. Um, so it's not a one easy, or oh, we need to do this and expect everybody to change. We, you know, these are hard uh, uh, changes like Aminuri mentioned. So um, Sri Lankan uh, teams out there listening today, uh, it won't be a one conversation and it won't get mm -hmm. solved. Um, so that's why I think Minuri is saying join with um, associations like us because then we can continue to support each other and give you more and relevant information to help make those changes. Thanks. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, I think you addressed this. What are your thoughts on expressive behavior on companies as opposed to instrumental behavior to address the root cause? Example, GitHub removing the term master or mentioned on manpower etc to mm -hmm. avoid slavery so um how should we react to these kinds of efforts by companies yeah uh this is an interesting one as well because the blm movement was something i've been trying to observe because i think you get just like extremism either way um in terms of doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing as well and like terms like this, that's what we are trying to do in our organization as well. It's trying to look at examples of, you know, where they make reference to manpower, et cetera. Um, but the question you need to ask is how much of an impact does taking words like that have in, in this current situation? Um, is it more like, you know, everybody is like in panic mode that you want to, you know, look at reviewing things, et cetera, because you don't want to get caught out. Um, to me, um, it should be more an ongoing conversation that needs to be had rather than these like movement specific, um, I guess, 
things that organizations try to do. So I hope it becomes more, I think in terms of how we should react, I think we should keep on organizations to be more mindful of, of how they react rather than these one-off things. Cause like, I think uh, Netflix, for example, with this whole role, they took Gone with the Wind away. And then there was this other backlash going, you know, it is of cultural significance and they added it back, right? Um, so you see, I think you have to learn to um, assess both sides of the stories and make it more an ongoing, like aware, keep them at their awareness um, rather than trying to make these snap decisions um, like you've mentioned here, I think. Next question, um, interesting point on value versus culture fit. Do you think this is more relevant in non-Western regions? Um, I feel culture fit is something that's given a lot of prominence in our country. Um, I think it's um, prevalent everywhere. Cause like I said, um, these unconscious biases come into play. And I think without the right training uh, for your managers in your organization, sometimes, like I said, with the examples I gave, they don't even know what they're doing is wrong uh, because what's worked for them in the past, they just keep applying, right? So you have to call these out. And I have seen it in like Western countries as well. That's worked where, you know, people with a funny sounding <laughs> name, you know, they don't hire because they think it's going to be hard for people on the assumption uh, that's going to be hard for people to pronounce. Um, so I think it's it's very much everywhere, uh, but I'd like to think um, Sri Lanka is very much evolving. I've seen some great companies who've gone outside the mold to hire, and you know we are having conversations through forums like DCLK. Um, so I, I think it, it, it's in both sides, not just um, the I guess Eastern countries, I say, or South Asian countries. Um, one more question and a few comments. Let me just get the question. Um, do you believe in quotas and how do you balance that against building an environment of meritocracy? Yeah, um, quotas is an interesting thing. And this is something I've uh, challenged myself to try and understand myself. But I think when it comes to quotas, especially when you're trying to uh, develop equity in your organization, I think quotas are very necessary because I see quotas as almost like, um, you know, an, gender equity campaign that you're trying to like run to raise awareness because if you don't get on the streets and you don't ask for certain things we're not going to get to a place where you want to so in Australia we should uh, we used to have um, this equality index right that was very much focused on the quotas and you know how many women you had but once with quotas they were able to get the numbers to a reasonable standard now they start reporting in terms of um, other equality means right so I think to get to a point of equity and not equality equity I think you need quotas especially um, for minority populations like women people with disabilities uh, to, to get to that to force ourselves to get there and from there once it becomes the norm I think it will become so natural to your organization to go seek diverse talent that you won't uh, be relying on quotas in the long term Thank you. Um, just a comment from Tanuja. Uh, I think the business case is that you retain talent and have the right people to lead your business. So absolutely, absolutely. But I think to enable that, you know, you very much need a diverse and inclusive. Uh, I like to use the word inclusive uh, more than diverse, because I think if the inclusion is there, the diversity will come. Absolutely. Okay, um, I think those are the questions. Thank you so much, Minuri. Um, I think the questions took as long as your presentation. So that means that was engaging. No, love it. That was good. Um, just to uh, wrap up, um, everybody, thanks for being here. Just wanted to share with you a little bit about Diversity Collective and what we are offering to help with uh, the change programs all of you um, asked questions about. Here are some of the sessions that we are putting together and we have right now not limited to, um, but um, what we do ask of you guys is if there are situations, uh, issues that you'll have and you'll want support um, by talking to us, we can uh, come up with other trainings, other sort of consulting solutions that would help you all to actually make the case in your companies or to your boss or to any particular person in, in any, any institute that you're working for. I know we refer to corporates a lot, but this is not limited to corporates. 
any group of people working together. Um, so some of the programs we have here, um, we have inclusive leadership and what that means and um, how to kind of highlight um, behaviors in managers. Then we have accelerating gender diversity, which is very much a great uh, session to actually get uh, a conversation going with the uh, women network in, in a company would be a great starting point. Uh, then we do have a little bit since we do have a lot of tech women in our um, association. Uh, this is on Agile and Scrum about how you uh, get certified and how you um, um, move it forward in your company. Personal agility is another good one on uh, personally uh, managing your effectiveness and becoming agile. Um, then the, the last one I've put on this list is about managing teams uh, remotely because now when you think of the world we have uh, kind of got kind of thrown into, uh, a lot of this becomes how you manage differently and being able to manage emotional well-being and be able to understand the, uh, the diversity of your team uh, becomes important and how you actually manage them inclusively. So here are some of the programs that we have. Um, on the left, we have also shared with you, if you want to join Diversity Collective, um, you can uh, click on that link and uh, it takes you to how you can stay connected with us. And if you want to contact us regarding these programs or any other questions, um, we have a um, email address also given down there. Um, as I mentioned before, this is one of a series of uh, webinars that we are uh, going to roll out. Please look forward to the next one um, that we will uh, signpost within the next couple of days. Um, so that's it from me. Just wanted to finally uh, mention uh, the different ways that you can engage with the Diversity Collective Lanka. You can become a member um, by signing up, like I just mentioned. You can do more like Minuri has been doing to actually volunteer to share information, get involved, uh, and go into the communities uh, to make a difference. Uh, and of course, the most important part that where we require funding, you could be a sponsor if you're a company, uh, you could uh, take some of these programs on, which helps Diversity Collective in uh, raising funds in order for us to go into the community and do more. Um, because like Chinti mentioned, we do a lot to try and raise visibility of um, women who are doing all this, but also to uh, be um, inspirational and be mentors to young women out there who uh, need to see women doing, being part of the change um, so that they realize it's possible. So um, I thank you again for joining us today. Hope this was useful and uh, hope to see you soon. That's a wrap.